Okay, well, welcome to the session uh, 280, um, Resuscitation in Sepsis, Not What Should We Do? Um, I want to thank uh, Chest for invitation and also the speakers for uh, coming to Montreal. So uh, we're going to start the um, uh, first presentation with Dr. Uh, Kumbo Nacelli. Dr. Kumbo Nacelli is from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he's part of the Spectrum Health. And he's also a clinical assistant professor of Michigan State University. So welcome and we are ready for you. Can you hear me in the back? So um, thank you, everybody, for the organizers and for Max to put this together. Um, this is a very controversial um, topic, as in um, our management of sepsis has evolved in various ways. And um, uh, during my formal training, I was uh, training medical um, critical care and pulmonary. But um, for the past few years, some of us have branched out. And we worked in collaboration with uh, surgeons and cardiothoracic surgeons and there's always the question whether okay we have a patient that is septic um, either presenting in the OR uh, presenting to the um, emergency department or uh, his uh, post-op day four after that and um, the patient is hypotensive it's three in the morning the surgeon calls you and says um, you know this guy I think he's a little septic uh, why don't you take a look you meet bedside CVP is five blood pressure is 80s over 40s and then what do we do? And I was um, thinking about how do I approach this, and uh, I was asked to present essentially what are the downsides of making decisions on fluid resuscitation and how does it impact our patients? Um, I hope that most of you had a chance of uh, hearing the lecture uh, yesterday for, uh, by Dr. Tabul. It was an excellent presentation regarding what devices we have available and uh, how to monitor what works and what doesn't work. My role today is gonna uh, attempt to help you and provide you with the tools for you to make your own decisions. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but for you to put everything together we're going to talk about and then come up with your own answer and hopefully it may change somewhat your practice. I know I'm, the, um, the audience here is varied. We have from uh, first year fellows to very seasoned uh, critical care attending. So, um, and hopefully we can answer all the questions at the end. Um, so that's the topic that I'm going to be discussing, prediction fluid response in septic shock. Uh, do we do it? Is it, is it worth seeing who would benefit or who wouldn't benefit? I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, Cardinal Richelieu. Essentially what he says that uh, it doesn't matter who writes what, there's always a way to make an argument against. Uh, and we've seen this many times over. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this at the end where a few years ago, dynamic measurements of uh, fluid responsiveness were discouraged where more recently uh, I feel that we're moving towards with a lot of evidence behind us that this is actually encouraged. Uh, okay, so very brief, I'm gonna try to you know, go fast over the few that we all know and then focus mainly on the ones that I can uh, shine some light. Essentially what we know about sepsis and um, uh, after Dr. Rivers' work is essentially that we need to control the source, the meat of my talk is about restoring perfusion and then antibiotics, everybody knows this and then a few years ago, we came up with this algorithm of early goal-directed therapy, and we said, you know what? Let's flood them, let's target CVP, let's transfuse and pressors, and that seemed to be a great idea at the time. I was training in Wayne State, and, and uh, Dr. Um, Rivers was on Henry Ford, and, and this was actually great. This was a fresh of breath air, and everybody started becoming protocolized, and it looks like we were making an impact. But obviously, as um, we learned over the past couple of years, you know, things may have switch a little bit, the paradigm may have changed. This is what everybody knows. Um, we have three trials, essentially, that I'm gonna just go over the bottom line. One is the process, essentially, early gold didn't improve mortality, arise, same thing. I can go slower, but you know, I have like 50 slides and only 20 minutes. Uh, and the promise that also early gold directed did not improve mortality, so that, you know, this is something that we all have to start thinking and you know, are we harming them? So these are the questions, and um, I don't have interactive questions, and the reason for that being is, um, you know, 
a lot of us, and I want you to think about what you would do and say, you know, if this is a clinical scenario, if I am f you know, faced with these questions, how would I answer if a first year fellow asked me, if a resident asked me, if I go and see a patient and the CVP is four, and hypothesis, do I give him fluids? What about if, uh, you know, the, my third year fellow got fancy, puts a um, stroke volume variation probe or um, pulse pressure variation probe and tells me that the variation is 15%, what do I do? And if I have a PA catheter on a septic patient and tell me that the wedge is five, am I gonna give him fluids? If they tell me it's 20, I'm gonna give him diuretics. And okay, so, you know, it's five in the morning, we have a code and the resident tells me that the patient is a little hypotensive and, you know, can I give him 500 of, uh, you know, not albumin, but maybe ringers. And uh, what do we say? Yes, no, get him through the morning. But what is it that we're trying to achieve with fluids? And uh, last but not least, we all have protocols uh, regarding sepsis and fluid resuscitation, but can we think about this more as a dynamic process as in phases? And um, the second thing that, the, the second part of the talk, essentially what I want to talk about is, is there any way to, for us to assess the biventricular preload responsiveness in order to know where in the starting curve are we? Are we in a failing heart? Is this a patient that essentially it's all maxed out with fluids and we just keep on pushing? How, what tools do we have to say, okay, this guy or this patient, we, we may not be able to provide him with more fluids and help him. And then the last question that I want you to answer at the end of the talk, or maybe start getting some more info to be able to answer, what, what's the difference between assessing the preload and assessing um, preload responsiveness? Here we go. So. Uh, following, I, I'm not going to go over what Dr. Thibault has said yesterday, but I'm going to give you just a brief uh, overview and then uh, go to the literature behind what I'm going to try to uh, share with you. So essentially, I have a patient that is septic. Is the patient, is the patient stable or unstable? Is the patient going to be fluid responsive or fluid unresponsive? And what are the risks of me providing somebody with fluids? Those are the three questions that you have to address in order to be able to provide the best and safest treatment as opposed to push fluids. So essentially, and again, I, I don't want to overlap what we was discussed already yesterday, but essentially, I, want, I invite you to go over essentially uh, the Starling curves and know that the only way that you are going to be able to improve perfusion on somebody is essentially by improving the stroke volume. It's not the pressure. You're not after improving the pressure. That is a consequence of. So essentially, it's not that we all have a lot of time to start building starting curves at three in the morning, but essentially start thinking, you know, for how long have I been doing this? How much fluid has somebody had? Do we have an echo? Do we know ejection fraction? Do we know if there's anything else going on? Is this secondary to what? So, and uh, here my two colleagues are gonna expand on this. Uh, but essentially remember that it is not the same to provide fluids to a patient depending on where in the starting curve they're gonna be. Uh, and essentially, this is the, the, the old gestalt, you know, don't give a lot of fluid to a CHF. It's not that we're going to put it in failure. It doesn't change your um, uh, stroke volume. You cannot vary stroke volume in a heart that cannot squeeze. So um, this is essentially to get my uh, presentation kick-started. Uh, they did uh, one of the um, outcomes that I find really interesting of the Fanny study was that essentially whenever we have patients um, uh, that got around half a liter to a liter and uh, 2,200 plus patients, how are clinicians making decisions? And you can see that essentially whenever the clinicians were saying how they were making decisions or what, the, what was the safety profile or what information were they making, 36% were still using CVP. And it's already established that it's not really a very good predictor of, of, of fluid responsiveness um, among selected patients. We're talking about the septic population. Uh, dynamic, really one out of five, and this is what is encouraged uh, and there's not a whole lot of documentation about end, on, end of organ perfusion. So go take a look at the patient, see the skin, check your lactates. All of those things are basic that at some point in time I feel that this fell through the cracks and we were not able to see that being done all across the board. And the conclusions of, uh, of the study was that we do, not, we do not routinely follow how are we providing the treatment. We don't use the safety limits, and I'm going to show you what, what those were. And when they failed a fluid challenge, that information was not really used. It sounds like at some point in time, you know, we keep on pushing fluid. So um, remember, we want to improve the cardiac output and not to include, uh, increase the um, blood pressure. And this is essentially one of the tables that, even though it's very busy, I want you to know, and if you want to uh, pay attention to the uh, lower end, uh, CVP, no, um, 329. Um, uh, patients were, or, or, or were used in order to make decisions, uh, occlusion pressure, 39, and all of those, and if you were to take a look, very few 
patients had decisions being made based on stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variations. Uh, very briefly, I think of sepsis as a dynamic. It's, it's in phases. You cannot attack the same problem from everywhere depending where you are. So essentially, one in five patients don't get appropriate fluid therapy, and you have to tailor the treatment to each patient individually. And you have to think of fluid as a drug. This is not just 250 and see what happens. It it's, has to be thought as a drug therapy. And you have three stages, essentially, which I'm going to add a fourth. But essentially, there's an initial stage of resuscitation. This is the first couple of hours. There's not a whole lot of point of being smart. Just flood them. Three liters, four liters, 30 milliliters per kick. And then it's time to start slowing down and say, where am I? What I want to achieve? And then maybe I want to start titrating and de-escalate, as we do with everything else. Um, so this is a very nice paper that I invite you to take a look. Essentially, what they talked about is the rescue phase, ER, or all of us that you know, do a little bit of, um, you know, we help the emergency department to make decisions. And uh, I invite you to go over this, but essentially think of sepsis as a dynamic. Don't treat, don't, don't, as, don't address a patient as if you were rescuing him at four days in the hospital. And um, it essentially tells you that um, when we have a rescue phase, there's not a whole lot of putting a, pre uh, per, um, a continuous oxygen monitor or trying to check the cardiac output. The, the, the rescue phase is a life-saving intervention, the first three or four hours. And then you move on, and then you keep on checking everything as we routinely do, and I don't think that this is the, um, the meat of the talk, but essentially the first few hours, flood them, then where we are. Uh, essentially, what are we going to do? Most of us, we train with CVP and pulmonary catheters. Um, very few of us do TTEs. I have the privilege of working in cardiothoracic ICU with ECMO, VATS, and um, I got to learn a little bit about ECHO, and, and, and that's, a, that's a tool that in the right setting we can uh, put to good use. Continuous oxygen saturations, and, and then uh, echocardiographic measurements of SVC, IVC, and our typical velocities, um, and you can see the other three. Uh, passive glare rays, SVV, SPP. And word to the wise, let's not use the CVP and PA as a single measurement. There's evidence behind it. You can read. My talk is going to be made available. Uh, there are reasons for this for you that are taking pictures. But all in all, um, it has not been proven that CVP or the PA catheter make, helps you make decisions on fluid strategy any better than a coin flip. And this is not taking into account the mortality of the procedures. Um, TTE, those that have a echocardiography, it's a good tool. I'm going to show you how so. But essentially, as a single, as a single measurement, it may not be the best to make decisions. And uh, it may have some type of role in patients with core pulmonary. Um, very briefly, uh, I am asked uh, frequently by uh, residents, you know, what are these dynamic measurements? What does it mean? Well, essentially what it is in a nutshell for those that uh, are less seasoned is um, essentially mechanical ventilation, positive pressure, the chain of events that happen, and how does it impact, impact ultimately on your systolic blood pressure and your post pressure. You can take a look. You can read. And in any paper in the past couple of years, you will find this slide. So, um, so what do we do? Essentially, we, can, we have tools available for us to be able to measure these changes regarding positive pressure or mechanical ventilation cycles in order to know if there's a change in the parameters that we are discussing, and ultimately, if by following those, we can impact mortality. Um, there's some limitations doing this, obviously, each... Um, um, each device or, or, or any of the apparatus that is available um, have some limitations, essentially what was it studied. So eight mils per kg, or patients that have a FIV or patients that don't have an A-line. All of those, um, they may be shortcomings of using each of the t um, devices that are available. But think about this and start exploring if you don't have it currently in your institution. All right. Uh, IVC, there's a role and there's a technique for us to be able to take a look and see the diameter of the inferior vena cava and how does it change with the cycle and the number the, the, there's some things that are essentially cutoffs. What is the number that I have to see variation for me to say this is a patient that most likely is going to respond to a fluid challenge? So I'm going to say that again. What is the cutoff number that I'm going to have to see in each of the techniques, IVC, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, for me to think this is somebody that most likely will be a fluid responder? And the number is always in the teens, and it depends on the, on the technique. The, the, the paper that I evaluated was Rigetti in 2014. Essentially, he saw that an 18% change correlated with 15% uh, change on cardiac index, which is essentially what we talked about. We talked about how do we come up with a strategy on fluid resuscitation or, or fluid challenges in order to improve the stroke volume, ultimately cardiac output, and not so much the blood pressure. Um, 
there's a little bit of uh, background information, but essentially, they essentially measure um, by Doppler the, the pulmonary trunk to, est um, to estimate the cardiac index. And um, the fluid challenge that they did was seven mils per kick, and the result was what we talked about. How good was this? This um, Dr. Um, Barbier was able to see that an 18% of change on the IVC diameter was able to correlate with 90%, 9-0, sensitivity and specificity for discriminating who's going to respond to a fluid challenge or not. So I invite you to start thinking about maybe grabbing the probe from our friends in radiology. They, they tend to share their tools graciously and maybe start learning how to take a look. It's super simple. It's bedside. Um, SVC collapsibility, same principle, um, and essentially um, you can take a look at the slide. It was prospective, mechanical ventilated patients, how much fluid they got, what fluid they got, and essentially um, when you have a collapsibility of 36%, that's the number that you may start thinking that, should I start thinking about fluids? Or, no, or thinking about not doing fluids. Our typical velocity is not the mid of the talk. Um, and essentially, um, all of these things is what we put into account whenever we talk about are we going to give somebody fluids or not. Same thing, these are all the things that you have to punch in your devices, your cardiac output, cardiac index are going to be resulted after you start putting an ALAN or, or a CVP monitor and so forth. But um, we're getting to the meat of the talk, which is mortality. And um, they evaluated some commercially available um, devices, and they actually saw that based on the information that was um, uh, visualized from these, you have some cutoffs of 10% of stroke volume variation and 12% of pulse pressure variation uh, based on um, the algorithm that the machine processes. And it's prospective for the two patients, and um, obviously there were higher measurements of this SVV and PPV on patients that are uh, responders. Passing leg race, if you don't have a patient intubated, uh, you can always do this. It's essentially as giving 300 cc bolus. And a 10% cutoff is essentially if you change your blood pressure by 10%, that is likely that whenever you give them 250 or 300 cc's, most likely that's going to affect uh, ultimately what you're trying to do is restore perfusion and improve output. Um, the four phases that we talked about, essentially think about this to move away from protocol saying keep on doing this until it works more so am I rescuing, I'm optimizing, or I'm essentially where am I? Am I first day, first hour, or, or four hours? So, mortality, let's talk about it. Any time that you start getting to around the three day mark is a time that mortality starts creeping up. I'm not saying don't give fluids. I'm saying that at three days, if you have a more positive fluid balance, that correlates more with mortality. And that was adjusted for severity score of the disease. These are not patients that got more fluids because they were sicker. They were equally sicker, but got more fluids. And whenever somebody has a little bit of acute kidney injury, they didn't show, um, um, this was Dr. Uh, Vilaka in 2014, he just didn't show that putting fluids will prevent development of acute kidney injury. So urine output coming down a little bit, can we do half a liter? Uh, that question probably has to be answered by you guys. Um, again, another, 173 person with sepsis, um, they got 11 liters over three days, and essentially they had the same output, but the non-survivors received more fluid. And more survivors, oh, sorry, non-survivors received more fluids, but more survivors had a negative balance at day four. I will let a little bit of this sinking. Um, when I was a fellow, you know, a lot of statistics, and, and what I came up with is, if I can put my finger between the two survivor curves, probably it's a good study, and I'm pretty sure that I can in this one. So uh, you can see that essentially, as, as days go by, when you know, whenever you have the fluid balance that is more positive, you know people start getting in trouble. Same thing. Uh, fluid balance and septic show, 42 patients. They were septic patients with bacteremia, some of them, prospective observational. And essentially, they see that a uh, higher accumulated uh, balance is correlated with positive fluid balance, so sorry, with adverse, adverse outcomes. So that was here in 2015. Same thing. This, this is essentially a graphic way to show that uh, blue is at 24 hours, green is at 48, uh, yellow is at uh, three days and then four days. To the left, you have the survivors. To the right, and you can see that the more fluids they get is uh, more likely for them to you know, have an increased mortality. I'm starting to wrap up. Um, different papers, still I can get my finger in between the lines. So I think that we are getting the idea of this. I'm almost wrapped up here. 
Um, and the one paper that I found very interesting, okay, so I have a patient that just came through the ER, I'm at uh, the second um, hour after they go to my um, ICU. When is the time that is best to give fluids? And I think I already hinted you on this, but essentially what they did is they took a look on the microvascular perfusion and they took a look at the plexuses under the tongue. And what they saw is that at 24 hours, they saw that by giving fluid, you can improve only early in the course. So at 24 hours, there was a response in the capillary um, system, but at two days, more fluids didn't necessarily restore perfusion. Uh, almost done. Uh, one more paper. Uh, this one found that uh, the CVP in the first 12 hours, in the CVP in the first uh, 12 hours may have may have a role in order to guide some fluid resuscitation, but after the 12 hours, it's not really um, any better than a coin flip. And um, almost done. This is an acute injury, acute kidney, uh, lung injury, sorry, and non-survivors obviously got my fluid, and this is a number of reasons for that, and we've all seen that. And um, uh, Dr. Murphy in CHESS 2009 essentially proved um, or, or published this. Negative balance probably, or even balance probably uh, improves mortality. Uh, very, very few, just, just to talk a second about other populations. They did some uh, cath and some echo on healthy subjects in 2004. No relationship between uh, really pulmonary pressure uh, with the CVP and then diastolic volume pressure. So uh, they didn't see that. Uh, two more papers. Uh, coin flip between the CVP of 8 and pulmonary artery occlusion pressure of less than 12. So coin flip, that's how well those predict. Last, among our cardiothoracic patients, um, there's really... Uh, more role of checking stroke volume variations and not so much CVP and pulmonary area occlusion pressures. Um, last slide. This is essentially a meta-analysis. Everything we talked about, static indices of um, preload are not good. They cannot predict. And dynamic ones, essentially post-pressure variation, uh, change in aortic uh, uh, velocity flow, and um, essentially dynamic changes with mechanical ventilation will help you not harm patients. So I would strongly suggest for you to start taking a look what you have available and maybe start putting this to good use. And um, these are the questions. Hopefully you have some of the answers. Um, and I would like to appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk and we'll take any questions at the end of the lecture. Thank you very much.